All right, good morning, Grace. I want to welcome you guys here once again. If we haven't met yet, I'm Clay, one of the pastors, along with Mark, who's away once again this week because he's on a vacation with his wife, Alicia. They're celebrating another anniversary. I can't remember how many it is. I think it's a big number. So what was that? 22, yeah. I was going to say 20, but I knew that was wrong, and I couldn't remember what it was. So 22 years, which is awesome. So I'm happy that they're able to go do that. And while Mark is gone, he's going to be able to still listen to this because we have it up on the website, like Jared said earlier. And uh, we're just really excited to be in this book of Colossians. Now, the reason we like the books of the Bible that we teach through is because we believe that the Bible is God's word. We believe it's been given to us to better know and understand who God is and what he's done for us. It's not just a list of rules of what we must do to be made right with God, but it's the grand story of redemption that shows us what God has done so that we could be made right with him. So, If you could bring out your Bible, whether that is in book or app form, and turn with me to the book of Colossians, we're going to be continuing on in chapter 2 this week, and like Jared did last week, opening up uh, the start of chapter 2, we're going to continue on in that. You can see it's going to be near the back of your Bible if you're using a paper Bible. Uh, You can use the table of contents if you're having a hard time finding it, or if you want to use the search function if you're using an app, that is entirely okay as well. And we're going to look at verses 8 through 15 today. So if if you're turned there while you're doing that, I'm going to pray and we're going to set our hearts right to hear from God's word. Father, I thank you so much once again that you've given us your word, that we can behold the beauty and the mystery of how much you love us and how much you've done for us. Pray that as we've opened your word this morning, that you would speak to us through it that you would open deaf ears and blind eyes to see the truth and beauty of the gospel. Father, I pray that you'd speak through me, that my words would be understood as you want them to be, and that you would allow us to rejoice in you together. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to listen to the scripture as it's read on the screen behind me, and then we're going to dig in once that's read. Reading from Colossians 2, verses 8 to 15. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised, not with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, but by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. All right, so just as a recap, last week Jared did a great job of his first sermon after being brought up as a elder candidate or pastoral candidate. And he started off chapter two where Paul is writing this letter to the church in Colossae and reminding them and reminding us of his goal for the church to be united in the gospel. And Paul's call for unity was not a call that everyone look and act exactly the same, but rather to remember their identity in Jesus, to live and act in accordance with who they now are in Christ. It means to be so in tune with the Spirit and so rooted in the gospel that their preferences or their differences of opinion They just fade away compared to their love for Jesus and love for one another. That's what true unity should look like. And so Paul says that one of the results of being unified in the gospel is that we'll actually be aware of plausible arguments that are trying to lead us away from Jesus. It's those false teachings that unless you're firm in the truth of what Jesus has done for you, could very well lead us astray. That's why they're plausible. Now, There's something really interesting that I see when I look at this little letter that we have from Paul. And I love how it actually takes Paul until chapter 2 before he starts to give any kind of commands to this church. See, all his teachings, all his admonishing, all his exhortation, 
all of it up to this point was just declaring who God is and what he's done. It's not just a list of do's that the church was supposed to do. And so if you're reading through this letter, you see that the first command to come up, as Jared touched on last week, was this general call to continue to walk in Jesus the same way you received him. It's by faith with Jesus as the root and the foundation of your life. But then in verse 8 here, he's going to start to get a little bit more specific. He says this, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So he's giving a warning here. And if you remember back to a few weeks ago, we saw back in chapter 1, part of the proclamation of the gospel needs to involve warning. So he gives this warning to not be taken captive, to not be made prisoner, to not get tangled up. And if you read through slowly, you might just start to wonder, well, what is something that could captivate me? What's something that could capture me? What's something that could steer me away from Jesus? Some of us might think, I'm fine. Nothing's going to steer me away from Jesus. But the reason Paul gives warnings is because he knows us. And so for the, the Colossian church, it was this certain kind of philosophy, something plausible, something convincing that was tempting them to be taken captive. Now, I don't know what you think about when you think of the word philosophy. Maybe you picture a group of old men. They're sitting up in a university lecture hall debating and discussing ethereal topics and arguing about theories about how the world works. Or maybe you've done a bit of study and names like Kierkegaard, Jung, or Marx come to mind. Or perhaps you're just more familiar with some of the modern day pop philosophers like Joe Rogan, Whoopi Goldberg, or Jordan Peterson. But either way, the there are philosophies in this world that risk capturing us. Now, philosophy is simply the study or the thinking through or the processing of how the world operates. It's looking at the nature of reality and existence. And this means, though, that in reality, we're all philosophers. I mean, I've said it before that we're all theologians, and when I say theology or being a theologian, theology simply means the study or understanding of God, which means that we all subscribe to some sort of understanding of God and reality, and that we live according to that understanding. So then the only question then arises is, where are you getting your theology? Where are you getting your philosophy? You see, Paul isn't telling us to ignore philosophy. He's not telling you to stop thinking, to stop pondering the, the nature of reality and existence. In fact, I, th I think it's really good for Christians to think deeply, to look at the way the world works and, and ask ourselves questions, to ponder and to wonder. God's created us to wonder. And I don't think it's even necessarily wrong to listen or read philosophy and look at the questions that other people are asking. It's good to know people. But as we read, as we listen, we need to be aware. See, Paul says, see to it. Some translations say, be careful or beware that no one takes you captive. Because of the plausible nature of a lot of these philosophies, Paul says, some of us just might get suckered in. Now, the thing about a lot of different philosophies is that they're rooted in an element of truth. They come about by studying the world that we can see, and then they try to extrapolate what might be the cause of what we see. And, and therefore, whatever kinds of conclusions we come to, it's going to lead to various outcomes. So there's spiritual philosophies out there that will look at the world and see that there's got to be more to this world than just what we can see. And so there's so many unexplained events that, that must mean that there's a spiritual realm of some sort. And so maybe these spiritual philosophies take some truths that we see in Scripture, but then they add a whole bunch of extra things. And then you've, you come to a philosophy that talks about worshiping angels or, or praying to dead saints. Or maybe you have philosophies that aren't spiritual at all. They're, they're based in naturalism with a view that there's nothing beyond what we can see. And maybe they correctly depict the problem of pain, disease, disunity, injustice amongst people. And they even take some ideas from Scripture about the inherent dignity of people. And they try to work out the best way to fix the pain and the wrongdoing in the world. But in doing so, many times they just potentially cause more disunity and add to the problem. 
So whether it's the philosophies of the ancient Stoics, modern left-leaning critical theorists, or the right-leaning conservative capitalist nationalists, there, there's likely actually elements of truth that are embedded within these ways of seeing the world. But the biggest problem is what we actually see in verse 8. It says they come according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. See, these other philosophies do not start and end with Jesus. These philosophies, they're void of seeing the world according to the truth of the one who made the world and everything in it, like we saw at the beginning of Colossians. So with all that in mind, I just want you to take a step back for a second and think. What are the philosophies that are influencing me? What am I allowing to enter into my mind? Who's talking to me? Who's teaching me? What books, what podcasts, what TV shows, what YouTube channels do you spend time with? See, every single one of these things, as benign as we might think that they are, they're, they're espousing some kind of philosophy. Every single one of them comes with an assumption of the way the world works and how we are to live out of that assumption. See, we're, we're, we're being influenced by these philosophies whether we know it or not. Now, it might not all look like a, a Richard Dawkins lecture on the complexity of the universe, which somehow will reveal the lack of a creator, and then that leads us to believe that life is short, has no real purpose other than just make the most of it while you can. It might not be as overt as listening to Jordan Peterson tell you how to follow his 12 rules for life so that you can experience a high degree of satisfaction in your accomplishments. It, it could actually just be as simple or as subtle as a home renovator telling you that they think the key to living a rewarding life is to organize your home better or get rid of clutter, or add more features or decorations to your house. Or maybe it's a nature documentary talking about how our planet evolved over billions of years by random chance and circumstance. See, all of these come from a philosophy of some sort. And the world is filled with empty philosophies, to use Paul's words. Whether humanistic or even spiritual, and these philosophies just completely ignore the very foundation that Paul told us to dig our roots into, which is Jesus. And so Paul says, do not be taken captive. Don't let them fool you. Do not let them sway you away from Jesus. Now, there's a, probably a very particular philosophy that Paul was really trying to allude to, as the word that he uses that's translated here in English, to take captive, it actually seems to be a bit of a pun. And Throughout this whole section, Paul's using a lot of wordplay. Since the Greek word that, that he uses to take captive, it's actually only a letter or two uh, away from the word synagogue. And so it's like he's saying that one of these empty philosophies is the idea that's coming out of the Jewish synagogues. Now, the synagogues were the places where religious Jews would gather to worship. And it was this idea that the only way to earn God's right standing was by works of the law. You've got to obey the Old Testament scriptures, the Torah, as it would have been known. Now, if you had grown up in the Jewish Old Covenant system, that would likely feel very plausible. And in a very similar way for many of us who grew up in a religious church setting, maybe you were taught the very same thing. I mean, how many of us were taught the Ten Commandments as young kids? And whether implicitly or explicitly, what we took away from this is that God loves and is pleased with those who keep his rules, and he's angry with those who don't. That's the kind of idea that many of us grew up thinking. But Paul says that this religious view of the world is also empty. Just like all the other philosophies that focus on humanity and what we must do to save the world or make the world a better place. See, whether it's Judaism, Catholicism, naturalism, environmentalism, Capitalism, liberalism, conservatism, minimalism, maximalism, Marxism, or nationalism, any philosophy that focuses on us and what we have to do and sets aside Jesus and what he's done, it's just empty and it's deceitful. That's not a philosophy that holds true to what we see in the scriptures. And so Paul continues in verse 9 and 10 with the basis of the antidote to these empty philosophies. He says this, 
For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you've been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. So he says the answer to these empty philosophies is to focus on the truth that Jesus is God in the flesh. So again, he's using wordplay. Remember, he talked about the emptiness of these philosophies. So he's contrasting the emptiness of these philosophies with the fullness of Jesus who came in the flesh. I mean, it's amazing because Jesus entered into his own creation and lived amongst those who rejected him, and this was his fullness. And so Paul says that any philosophy that denies Jesus as the one true God is is empty. It's useless. It's not going to lead to flourishing. It's not going to lead to life. He says it's just a dead end. But look at what we get in Jesus instead. For those who believe in Jesus and trust in him as the head and all rule and all authority, it says we get to be filled in him. So it means Jesus is better than any empty philosophy. So if you've been feeling empty, if you're getting burnt out, if you know there's something missing in your life, but your outlook on the world just tells you that you have to look inside yourself, or maybe you need to to go find it in joining this, that, or some other cause, Paul tells us that we can stop looking. We can stop trying to work to earn our place with God because he knows there's nothing else that actually has the power to ease our emptiness. But he says that Jesus is here and he's ready and he's willing to fill you. So then he continues in verse 11. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through the faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So again, trying to point out that these Colossian Christians, who are most likely Gentiles, which means non-Jewish believers, he's reminding them that they didn't need to follow the Old Testament law. And he says that they don't need to be circumcised because if they've been saved by Jesus... They've already received a truer circumcision. Now, some of you who might be new to the Bible will look at this and just wonder, what does circumcision have to do with anything? And and maybe if you're 20 or younger, you might not even know what circumcision is. But it all goes back to the very first book of the Bible, which is Genesis, where God makes a covenant with a man named Abraham, or who was known as Abram before that. Now, he gives Abraham this promise that God would be with him, and even though Abraham was an old man, with a very old wife, and they hadn't had any kids yet, somehow, God would bless Abraham with a family and descendants too numerous to count. And he gives him this promise with his covenant. And as a sign of this covenant, as a sign of believing this promise, Abraham was told to circumcise or to cut off the flesh of the foreskins or the outer skins of the most sensitive area of every male in the household. And for generations... And so we might look at this and think, that's weird. And I don't blame you if you do. But what we do see here is that God likes to work through symbols. And God figures that it's going to help us to understand and remember things if we see things happen again and again and again through signs and patterns. And so God wanted Abraham and all his descendants to be able to look at themselves and remember they had been set apart. They had been cut off from living like the rest of the world and invited into something greater. See, their growth as a people, their reproduction, their continued ability to bring forth offspring was only there because of the promises of God. The sign of circumcision was not arbitrary. But even for us, when we see things at one level, God still oftentimes has a deeper meaning in mind as well. Because when we read through the prophets, we actually see that the circumcision of their foreskins, that was just to be a picture of the true and better circumcision to come of their hearts, their souls, their motivations. Even in the book of Deuteronomy, when Moses is delivering the old covenant law, God promises that even after they've sinned, there will be a day that they repent and turn back and ask forgiveness. And Deuteronomy 30, verse 6 says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring 
so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. So even the sign of circumcision was a sign of a greater circumcision of the heart to come. And so Paul, back to the Colossians here, says, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. So there was no need for a physical circumcision now, which is what some of these Jewish false teachers were likely insisting upon because of the Old Testament law. And so now when Paul says without hands, he's taking a well-known Jewish saying and he reverses it. There he goes with the wordplay again because when they would have often spoken of things made with hands, they were often talking about creating idols. So Paul now says that the time of following the Old Testament Torah has come to an end. And any attempt to actually pass that off as a requirement for these new Christians is to now actually be regarded as religious idolatry. Because upon our belief in Jesus, we've now been circumcised in our hearts, which means we don't need to be circumcised in the flesh. So now the physical sign that we receive, it's no longer circumcision, but it's baptism. Now male and female both get to enjoy this new physical sign. And this is why verse 11 continues. By putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him, that's Jesus, from the dead. So because Jesus died and rose again, by belief in him, we now go through a different sign. And it's, it's one that doesn't just symbolize being born into a family and now able to reproduce through physical means, but being born again into the kingdom of God by the power of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so this is even why when we baptize people, we do so not when they're babies, not based on the physical family that they've been born into, not based on a familial Old Testament kind of promise, but based on the new covenant promise for those who have been spiritually born again, demonstrated by their belief in the gospel. So Paul wants us to remember, we don't need to follow the emptiness and the philosophies of works-based religion. Which hopefully for a lot of us, if that's the kind of thing we're prone to, we can take a sigh of relief. Because we probably recognize after not too long that we just can't do it. And if we're trying to feel like God loves us based on what we've done, we're going to continually feel like God is disappointed in us. So then as a part of that, at the start of verse 13, Paul wants to remind them of where they were before Jesus saved them. He says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. So in a sense, he's saying that whether they were circumcised in the flesh or not, they were dead in their trespasses, dead in their sins, unable to perfectly keep the old covenant law. They revealed the uncircumcision of their hearts by their actions and their motives. And honestly, this is where we all were too. Now, there's so many people who, in, in the world who have this philosophy that mankind is basically good. And we just sometimes mess up and do bad things. But this is another empty philosophy because if all, all you have to do is take a look around. The world's a mess. Now, yes, even in the mess, there's, there is a lot of good out there, but it's not because we're basically good. It's because we're not as bad as we could be. It's because God is restraining evil and God is good. He's the one who initiates the good. But it's also that we properly don't know how to differentiate good and evil. We can't calibrate ourselves to what it actually means to do good and be good because we've been corrupted. And so it's not all uncommon for people to call good evil and evil good. See, God created mankind to perfectly reflect God. We were supposed to show him off to the rest of the world by, by listening to God and following his rule and reign. But we've, we've blown it. Every last one of us continues to demonstrate that we've, we would rather be our own ruler than follow God's perfect plans and designs. And so in response to this, some of us think, well, you got to pick yourself up. Dust yourself off. Get to work. Rescue yourself, redeem yourself, justify your existence, and show God that you're worth being put on his team. How many of us subtly think that way? And so you, you start to hear then all these philosophies that are going to start to come up and call you to be a better man, be a better woman. Set up for yourself a rule of life so that you can follow that 
to be who you were made to be. Show the world that you're not the incapable, self-absorbed narcissist that you used to be. Love others, serve the poor, be a better person. There's a ton of philosophies that will remind you of that and then tell you to do those things. And some of them will even quote scripture. Trouble is, how do you do that when you're dead? It doesn't say here that we were unconscious or that we'd simply just fallen down on the ground. It says we were dead, spiritually dead in our trespasses. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen a dead person just decide to get up and heal themselves of their own accord. See, if your heart stops beating, even if there's a defibrillator right next to you, you can't just reach over and zap yourself back to life. You need someone else to administer it. So then verse 14 doubles down on this and tells us that we had a debt to our own account that we couldn't pay with all its legal demands. So Paul then uses this language to demonstrate because of our sin, we were lost and completely hopeless. But I'm excited that he uses the past tense. We were. Because that was before Jesus saved us. But now look at what Paul says. Let's look at all of verses 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So we don't come alive by our own doing. We don't come alive by our religious duties or rituals. We come alive because God made us alive through Jesus. I'm not the one who made myself come back to life. I didn't save myself. Jesus saved me. He's forgiven our trespasses, forgiven our sins, forgiving us for choosing ourselves over God. And he says that he did it by canceling our record of debt. Now, Paul uses language once again, this legal language that pretty much anyone in the Roman Empire would have understood that in that day. Now, when someone went to prison, they would have had this sheet of offenses nailed above their cell, listing all the reasons that they were being held and punished. And this would have been called the record of debt. Now, you, you may have heard someone use the, the phrase, paying their debt to society in regards to someone finally finishing their, their prison term. And so we see here that our sin incurred a debt owed to God that we could never pay. It wasn't just a debt to society. It was a debt to God, the creator of the universe. And we couldn't pay it. But God wasn't just satisfied with sweeping our sin under the rug. He, he wouldn't just forget it as if it never happened because that would make God unjust. Because the wages of sin is death. So rather than make us justly pay for it, Jesus, being our substitute, he took that debt. He took that record and all the legal demands that stood against us. And instead of nailing it above our cell, condemning us to an eternity of just suffering, he took it upon himself and nailed it to the cross. Jesus became sin for us. Jesus suffered in our place for our sin. He took the punishment that we deserved so that we could be made alive in him, so that we could escape captivity, so we could be set free from believing the empty philosophies, free from sin, free from death, free to live in the light of his glory and grace. And this is why in verse 15, Paul says, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Again, Paul's using another play on words, and he uses the language of triumph. In those days when a battle was won, the leader of the army would be paraded through the city in, in great triumph, and they would openly shame the losing army and anyone who would dare come against this victorious leader. And Paul says that in the upside-down kingdom of Jesus, when it looked like Jesus was being defeated, it was actually Jesus triumphing over his enemies. And he did that in order to set us free. 
Which again brings us back to that warning, do not be held captive. See, Jesus looked like a victim, but he was actually actually the true victor. What looked like the path of death for anyone who would dare follow Jesus is actually the path of life. So many philosophies might look at Christianity and say, I don't think it's worth it. You guys look kind of lame. You guys are willing to give up that just for some God? Like, just enjoy your life. Get on with it. But what if Jesus is actually the path that brings us life? Gives us the greater joy that we could never have elsewise. See, the only reason we could be made alive is because Jesus willingly took the nails on the cross to die in our place. How can we not follow after him? He substituted himself for us. He paid our debt. He took our place so that we could be made alive. This means you don't need to fix yourself. You don't need to run to empty philosophies. You don't need to follow the Old Testament law. You don't need to look for angels or saints to help you through. You don't need to be deceived by empty philosophy, which is going to try to convince you over and over and over again how you can be filled and made whole. The truth is, you need Jesus. You need his salvation. You need his forgiveness. You need to be born again and filled with his spirit. So don't be taken captive by all these other philosophies. As a church, let's trust Jesus. Let's follow him and let's rejoice in him and what he's done for us. So Father, I just pray that you would allow us as a church to understand the philosophies of this world and yet not be taken captive by them. I pray that we would see that the The greatest story, the greatest philosophy is that Jesus is God. This is the reality that is greater than any other reality. Father, help us to embrace that truth. Embrace the beauty of the gospel that Jesus has taken our place, forgiven us of our sin and our debt, and invites us into glorious reunion with him. Father, give us hope that we can continue to grow in the likeness of Jesus by the power of your spirit and give us joy as we continue to pursue, pursue you, pursue our love for you, pursue our knowledge of you, and to pursue following after you in love for one another as well. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.